stuff, so yeah, probably computers. Um, <laughs> just want to thank uh, the Coaches Association for voting my dad in for this. I want to thank you guys for taking the time to do this. Uh, I want to congratulate uh, Coach Jensen and Coach Mack for uh, also being inducted. It's awesome. even harder when my mother passed away last summer and we cleaned up the house and I found two things that he wrote on about his career. There was a napkin listing all the players that went to college that he coached. A napkin. Okay. And then there was a resume from 1988. And that's what I have to go on. Okay. Uh, not much to go on. <laughs> so um, it's pretty clear to me my dad wasn't about tremendous losses. It wasn't about the stats. It wasn't about uh, the kids that went and played pro, things like that. He kept track of people, but it wasn't, he didn't live through them. You know? So I'm just going to talk a little bit about who my dad was and some of the things I learned while coaching with him. I did have the privilege to coach with him for 11 years, and uh, I'm going to stay with that. <laughs> <laughs> my dad was born in 1933, and actually his name was Raleigh Oxwright. Rolling Dog. And uh, he was born in Spokane. And his mother left when he was four. And his dad handed him to his grandparents when he was six. <coughs> um, which left a pretty lasting impact on uh, He was raised by his grandparents. And I don't know when, but the Robbins family took him in a little bit later, like around 10 or 11. And hence why I'm now a Robbins instead of an Oxford. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that's his childhood. And during that time, there's a couple stories out of it. You know, when he lived with his grandparents at age six, uh, he was locked out of the house at eight in the morning. He wasn't allowed home until 8 p.m. at night. And they didn't want him there. So this is Spokane. It's not exactly normal here around there. So dad, when he took me back and took me tours of the place, he showed me where he'd get newspapers for restaurant owners and things like that so he could stay in the back door and stay warm. And maybe some of those guys would take pity and give him some food. You know, that's one story. The other one, a little bit later in junior high, he said there was a guy down the street that loved to beat him up every day when he was coming home from junior high. And uh, that was a couple years, he said. I managed to stop it. One day I was running. He said, I put up my fist, and the guy ran into it. And that ended that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, uh, I think the big deal for him was when he started playing football. Uh, my dad was not expected to graduate from junior high. He did not expect to graduate from high school. He was one of those introverts that read books all the time and kept to himself, and expectations for him were not very high. But when he started playing football, he found a reason to take care of his school. If he could get his grades and go to class and do the things, he could get on the field and play something he really liked playing. So he already started about by the time he was a senior, he was all city lineman, and he went to the state game. And that was the first time he said he left the Spokane City Limits on his own. He hitchhiked to the game. And a little side story to that, I was working with him in the yard one day and I realized he doesn't have a straight finger on his hand to save his soul. And he related to me about the Allstate game. He said, well, back then, we were taught to take our two fingers, wrap them up in the jersey. The guy couldn't get away. That's how you tell. Oh, wow. He said, the downside of that is you break your fingers. <laughs> He, says, I, he says, said, I went to the doctor once, and he asked me why I was even bothered showing up. I said, well, this time the bone's through the skin, so i got to be here. Okay? But uh, when he went to the Allstate game, he had some broken hands, he had cracked ribs, he had staph infection. He said the coaches were kind enough to help him with the staph infection, and they shot him up with a bunch of locals so he could play the game. He says they were really nice, because after the game, they shot him up with some more locals so he could go home. <laughs> 
said he got home and he crawled upstairs into his bathroom and he passed out. And he woke up, he was coming in and out of his lapsing, in and out of consciousness, basically. And he was very sick. He stayed up there for about two to three days. And one of his neighbors noticed that he wasn't out and about like he should be. So he went over to help him, went upstairs and found Dad. And uh, he says, I got something for you. Went home, got him a bottle of whiskey. Took it upstairs, <laughs> says, this will cure everything you have. Might add that medicine's changed a little bit in the last 50, 60 years. <laughs> but that was, you know, some, some of the stories I remember him telling me about. Uh, for college, he chose to go to Whitworth College. And he had some options, but he chose to go to Whitworth. And I'm guessing it kept him near uh, his future wife and kept him in a place in town. That was Spokane. And uh, he did start all four years there. He lettered all four years there. And... Uh, during his time in college, he got drafted in the Army. When he got married when he was 20, the uh, uh, dean students thought he wasn't coming back, so he turned in his name. So he got to go to the Army for two years, right in the middle of college. One of the stories that comes out of his time in the Army was uh, they came to his base and they said they were starting a 14-person recon unit. And anybody was willing to try out, to try out. 105 guys wanted to be on that 14-man unit. And my dad's story is, you know, he made number 14. Mom's story is, he was actually number 16. <laughs> dad wore out number 15. And number 14, I remember dad telling me, he finally admitted this about, I don't know, 10 years ago. Finally admitted to me, he says, yeah, number 14, we were out in the field, the guy looked at me and goes, you're just not going to quit, are you? He says, no. He says, it's yours, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> so, that speaks a little bit to the character of my dad. He may have not been the best, but when he wanted to do something, he put his mind to it, it was going to happen. Um, the other thing about Whitworth that stands out is he talked a lot about Whitworth was a Christian college. And the players they recruited weren't exactly Christian. Uh, he said the right tackle was out of the state pen, and the center was out of the local Spokane County Jail, and so forth. But what happened was these coaches were bringing these guys in, and they intentionally recruited those guys. And what they did on Friday nights is they opened up their house and had the team over for dinner. And the president of the school had the players over for dinner. And my dad said that was the first time he saw a family set. And he met coaches who were humble, willing to open up their homes and share with them their lifestyle. And that's when my dad became a Christian. He saw some coaches that walked the talk and cared about their kids. And that's where I think that's the mark that set my dad just out of coaching for the next 40 years. You know, uh, I remember growing up, we'd have, you probably remember, we had guys showing up out of the blue that would just live in our basement. Had no place to stay, we were going to be at Whitworth soon. They get up in the morning and there's three guys trapped on the couch. You know, he took care of them. You know, they were going to play for him someday. So they can find a place to get on their feet, you can stay at our house. Um, the other thing I remember was he admitted that uh, when he got done with high school, he went back to his junior high teachers and showed them his high school diploma because they didn't expect him to make it. And he let them know they were wrong. He got his college degree, went back to his high school, showed them that, let them know. He were wrong. And when he got his master's, he went back to take his degree money. <laughs> <laughs> so, he was pretty close to a doctorate, too. Yes, he was a thesis away from a doctorate. And unfortunately, he did that the year at Oregon State that they beat the UW when I was at the UW. We won't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> On to coaching. Um, my dad's style of coaching, he was known to be able to get the most out of teams. He was. After, I coached with him for 11 years, and I learned pretty quick. And my dad wasn't exactly the X's and O's guy. He loved offense, but his real job was to get kids on the field. And he had other coaches take care of the details. But his big job was to get the kids motivated, get them out there. And uh, my first lesson from him, he hired me in 88, because I wasn't in between jobs. He said, you're not going to sit on your butt. But uh, in 99, I became his, in 89, I became his DC. He said, here's the golden rule. Offensive coordinator has my back, and whatever he calls, he calls. It's none of your business. <coughs> you never question.
question, why do you pause? Because you're questioning me. <clears throat> Same token, when the offensive coordinator gets upset with you, he's got nothing to say. Right back to your pause. So there's no arguing between the two of you, and there should be no talk. Number two, never, you know, never ever discredit a coach in front of the players. And those were the two simple rules that I coached with him for 11 years. You know? One of the other things I remember was my first game as a DC. I learned to watch the offensive coordinator of my dad make sure they don't throw the ball with a minute 20 left in the game on the 40 yard line. Because <laughs> we were up by three and I just finally got a stop on the 18 and I thought we were done. And I turned around and sure enough, our sophomore quarterback started in his first game, apparently needed some passing experience. <laughs> and they thought, they're going to be playing run and pack the box, so a little quick out would be wide open. Kid threw it right to the corner and ran it down to our two-yard line. And I, the thing that I remember the most, looking down the sidelines, and my dad was calmly sitting there like this, and he watched it. <laughs> and Al looks at me and goes, wow, that was really not the right play to call, was it? I goes, yeah, that didn't work. And that was it. <laughs> they didn't get upset. There was no anger. It was like, huh, well, that didn't work. Good luck. Get your defense out there. Better win the game. <laughs> um, one of our practices, my dad was kind of hamming it up with the players. And I was in my 20s, and it was a little embarrassing for me for whatever reason. I remember standing next to Al, his offensive coordinator, and saying, you know, I, I hope I don't grow up goofy like that. <laughs> Al looked at me and goes, you should be so lucky. Your dad has an amazing way with players. I get a guy coming to me about playing time. And by the time I'm done with him, he's, he hates me. He leaves the room, stormed out, walking off, stomping down the hall. Shoot, I send him in with your dad. Five minutes later, he comes out with a jock strap and socks, and he's happy just to practice again. <laughs> he says, and that's a skill. He says, you should be so lucky to get half of it. And a little while later, one other practice. Al was out explaining our offense, and there was a certain play, I always run puck sweep, 36 trap, wing tee. And uh, my dad comes up, nudges me, and he goes, uh, watch this. So he goes up, and uh, Al was explaining the play, and he goes, hey, Al, you know, uh, doesn't the tackle block this guy, and the tight end block this guy, and the corner and the wing blocks this guy? And then we just kind of do this with the guard. Al looks at me and goes, what are you talking about? Well, we just spent 10 minutes going over this. 20 years, we've never run it that way. What are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm sorry, oh gosh. He goes, get out of here, get out of the door, get out of here. Let me fix this. And he starts telling the kids what to do. My dad just comes back, finally gets next to me, turns around and he goes, I gotta do that once a year just to keep moms. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, with that said, uh, the final memory for me when my dad passed away in 2007, we were talking about him to the youth past, uh, the pastors the ceremony. And my mom described him as a guy that uh, was a Christian person. But if there was a fence between people going in the good direction and people going in the bad direction, <coughs> my dad was one of those that never left the fence. He might have been on the side that was going good, but he never walked away from the fence so he'd lose vision of it. He was always one of those guys that reached over the fence and try and grab a kid that needed a father figure or a kid that needed encouragement to stay in school or best yet play football for him as you can tell from his life story football was a vehicle that got him an education he couldn't have made it to Whitworth without a scholarship he would have never had that education and he never would have been a teacher and a coach so my what do you call it uh, challenge to coaches, still coaching. Let's get after those kids. They're right on the edge. They could use a little encouragement. Maybe a dinner at the house or a welcome. 